Hi all, Alicia Tubbs here with Evangelize Georgia, formerly the Sudden Homesteader. And today I want to talk about the missions trip that I just got back from. My family and I were able to join our church youth group and we went to Ducktown, Tennessee. It's a very needy area of the United States and we were able to go and serve there. There was a team that worked on construction, on houses, things that needed repairs. And then another group of us got to serve at the crisis center or donation center. And we just had a great time. My kids came and they just loved it. It was a great alternative to a family vacation. We got to help people, to serve, to preach the gospel. So it was just a win-win-win all around. I'm going to share some insights that I had while on this trip. I was responsible for handing out backpacks for back to school at the donation center and my church congregation contributed snacks and hygiene items that we were able to pack into the backpacks. We also packed Bibles into the backpacks and we gave away gospel tracts and shared the gospel as we distributed these backpacks. We gave away over 100 backpacks, tracts, and Bibles. And as I was talking to the people who were coming and getting backpacks, I noticed that there was a lot of faith. Praise be to God. Sometimes when you evangelize, you go to an area and there is a lot of faith. There's always unbelievers, no matter how much faith there is in a particular location. As I served at the donation center, I had many good conversations and I heard lots of testimonies. As I was speaking to this one woman about Jesus, she told me about how she had recently been through a very difficult time in her life and how Jesus had gotten her through it. She and her daughter had gone on a beach trip not too long ago. In the car, this woman and her daughter had got to talking, and her daughter said to her mother that she had put her faith in Jesus when she was 15, but she wanted to be sure that she was saved. And when they got to the beach, her mom sat down with her, and they had a good conversation about being saved, and her mom shared the Bible with her. And she said her daughter was so full of joy about Jesus that she ran out of the vacation rental and just kept running on the beach like a child. The woman described her daughter as having a glow about her for the whole trip. And one day, while they were on the beach during this trip, this woman's daughter had just got done helping some of the kids collect seashells. And she raised her hand up to the sky and asked God what else he had for her to do. That hour, this young woman saved two children from drowning. But she had exhausted herself and ended up drowning herself. Her mother watched from the shore as her daughter held up her hand to the sky as if to wave goodbye. But her mother told me that she knew that that was the very moment that Jesus had taken hold of her daughter's soul and taken her up to be with him. And we know the Bible tells us to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord for those who have put their trust in Jesus. The mother of this young hero asked me to share this testimony with anyone I could. She thought it was special. And I think it's really special, too. This young woman who gave up her life to save these children had received Jesus joyfully and renewed her hope and her love in Jesus just days before she passed away. And she had something that we all must have if we're going to enter the kingdom of heaven. She had childlike faith. To raise up your hand to heaven and ask the Lord, what do you have for me now, is a clear indication of someone who is looking to be obedient to the Father, someone who is looking to follow like a child follows a parent. I saw the same kind of childlike faith the week that I was serving in Ducktown, Tennessee, when I encountered a grown man who had never heard the gospel before. He had come to the donation center with his daughter, and we got to talking, and I asked him if he'd like to hear about how he can live forever with God. And he said yes. And that man sat down and he listened to the gospel message like a child hearing a great adventure story for the first time ever. And we know that the gospel is no story. We know that it is the truth. It is the only truth that can save a soul for eternity. And that man sat there and listened to the truth and received the truth. And he put his faith in Jesus Christ that day. All glory to God. This man had a humble heart a heart that was thirsting for truth, and he was ready and willing to quench that thirst with the living water that only Jesus can give. Psalm 34, 18 tells us, The Lord is near to those whose hearts are humble. All God needs from any of us is a humble heart, a childlike, not childish, faith. 
that says, Here I am, Lord. Save me. Use me. One of the many reasons why I like working with youth and kids so much is that their faith is oftentimes childlike. They're not perfect. They're sinners, just like all of us. But many children and youth intuitively understand how to abide with others, how to trust in those who've been given the privilege to lead them. When they want to learn about something, they don't request extensive training or rush to enroll in a course. They watch how their daddy does it or how their youth leader does it, and they follow along. They jump in and try it. I'm reminded of my own children. Whenever my husband sets out to do a task, our kids ask if they can help. Whenever I cook or clean, my children watch my every move, and then they do likewise, and they try to mimic my work. And when they get really good at mimicking me, I invite them to actually partake of my work to help me. I have seen in many churches that whenever a youth leader says, we're going on a missions trip, the youth will immediately say, I'm in, or can I come, or I'm coming. They don't ask for details or itinerary. They ask to abide with their leader, trusting him, knowing that if he is trustworthy, he will lead them well, and he will give them exactly what they need when they need it. When a task needs doing or when an opportunity arises, the childlike person who is humble of heart raises a hand and says, what do you have for me? Can I help? Can I come? The person with childlike faith trusts that he or she will learn as he goes along. As I handed out backpacks at the donation center and I shared the gospel, it was the youth and young people who abided with me that got the training that they needed to do the same. And after a few moments of watching me and a few sideline coaching conversations, those with childlike faith rose up and did likewise, and they too were able to share the gospel and hand out backpacks. It was very simple for them. It was very effortless. The humble of heart, those with childlike faith, get their training by going in faith, by trusting, by abiding. Proud and entitled people demand training ahead of the task. The reason why cults and false religions have extensive evangelism training is that they have not humbled themselves and received the true Jesus. They do not have true Christian fellowship. Instead of the living God, they have a taskmaster, God, lowercase g, of their own making. Instead of brothers and sisters, they have acquaintances and colleagues. They do not know how to abide, to truly abide united in one spirit because they do not have the Holy Spirit who only comes to dwell with those with true saving faith in the true saving Jesus Christ of the Bible. Childlike faith abides first with the true and living God, then with our regenerate brothers and sisters. Childlike faith trusts that the training we need for whatever God has tasked us with will come at just the right time in just the right way. Extensive programs and itineraries may be needed at some point, and those who abide with God and who fellowship with their true family in Christ will be a part of those programs in God's time. The Bible shows us that those who abided with Jesus heard his best preaching first. Those who humbled themselves, who came to him, who followed him into the wilderness, were the ones to receive all that they needed. We read in Matthew chapter 15, verses 29 through 33. And Jesus departed from thence and came nigh unto the Sea of Galilee and went up into a mountain and sat down there. And great multitudes came unto him, having with them those that were lame, blind, dumb, maimed, and many others, and cast them down at Jesus' feet. And he healed them insomuch that the multitude wondered when they saw the dumb to speak, the maimed to be whole, the lame to walk, and the blind to see. And they glorified the God of Israel. Then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat. I will not send them away fasting, lest they faint in the way. And his disciples say unto him, Whence should we go? Whence should we have so much bread in the wilderness as to fill so great a multitude? From this passage, we can see that it was a humble multitude. Those who needed healing, who were seeking, 
the sick, the lame, these were the ones who followed him with childlike faith into the wilderness. And the wilderness is not an ideal location. I followed my youth group leader to a campsite where I had my own cabin, I had three meals a day, I had air conditioning, running water. The people who followed Jesus in this passage did not have any of that. And they didn't worry. They didn't worry that they wouldn't have enough food for the return trip. Perhaps some of them did, but they still followed Jesus. They didn't let that worry hinder them. They didn't demand a three-day itinerary from Jesus. When they went to that wilderness, they had no idea how long they would be abiding with him, how long they would be listening to him and seeking him for healing. They didn't even stop to consider the impracticality of carrying an injured person into the wilderness. What if Jesus couldn't heal that person? They would have to carry that person back. None of that hindered this multitude. It says the multitude, a great many of people, went and followed Jesus with childlike faith. They had faith first. They had faith that Jesus was the Messiah, that he could heal them. And that whatever happened, they would have all that they need because of who Jesus is. He is God in the flesh, creator, sustainer, provider. They followed him like little children who would follow their own father almost anywhere. When my own family goes on vacations or gets into the car to go somewhere, my children excitedly hop in. They don't worry about not having food or us getting lost or the car breaking down. They don't worry or hesitate because they're afraid that they might suffer if mommy and daddy make poor decisions along the way. And any number of those things could happen, right? Bad things could happen on this trip. But my children still trust us enough to get in the car willingly some of the time. But most of the time they get in willingly and excitedly because they trust mommy and daddy. They trust us to get them to where we need to go. They trust us to provide. They trust that we know the way. And all my children have to do is get in the car and abide. And this is the way that we are to follow Jesus, trusting that he is who he says he is, that he is the I am, that he is God in the flesh, that he will provide that he pre-existed all things, that he has no beginning and no end, that he is the Alpha and Omega, that through him and for him all things were created. He knows the way everywhere, and he is the way. We just have to trust. We just have to get into the car. We just have to walk after he walks. If you notice in verse 32 of this passage, even after following Jesus for three days with nothing to eat, the people had not turned away. They did not grumble like the Israelites of the Exodus who were wandering in the wilderness for about 40 years. These followers stuck with Jesus even after having fasted for three days. Now the disciples were a little worried. We can tell that by verse 33 when the disciples asked, When should we have so much bread in the wilderness as to fill so great a multitude? Right? They were a little worried. They were wondering, where is this provision going to come from? And we have to remember the disciples had not yet been filled by the Holy Spirit. They had not yet witnessed Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. They had seen many signs and wonders, but they still had their doubts. And we all do. But notice how Jesus responds to these doubts. He doesn't answer his disciples by giving away his entire game plan. He doesn't call them into a huddle and explain exactly what he's going to do next. He just does what the Father tells him to do, right? Because Jesus was 100% obedient to the Father. And he expects the disciples to simply follow along, which they do. In verses 34 through 39, we read, And Jesus saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? And they said, Seven, and a few little fishes. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and the fishes and gave thanks and break them, and gave to his disciples, and the disciples to the multitude, and they did all eat, and were filled. And they took up of the broken meat that was left seven baskets full, and they that did eat were four thousand men beside women and children. And he sent away the multitude, and took ship, and came into the coasts of Magdala. 
Despite their misgivings, the disciples still listened. They followed Jesus' commands. They obviously had their doubts, but they still abided. Doubts happen. Questions arise in our minds. We are sometimes cautious, even in situations when we shouldn't be because God is in charge. God understands our weaknesses. He understands that our faith is not perfect. We need to understand that Jesus is going to save, deliver, provide, and succeed despite our doubts, despite our demands. And we can choose to be disciples that abide and trust, that follow in faith, or we can serve Jesus with dragging feet, with entitlement, with doubts, with demands. The question is, are we going to be childlike and follow Jesus into the wilderness without worry or complaint? Or will we be childish and demand our way? Will we demand that God tells us exactly what's going on, where we're headed, what we will eat, what we will wear? Will we doubt God's goodness that he will provide for us even if we've been in the wilderness for three days without food? And even if we are childish, even if we do succumb to our fleshly desires, the good news is that even when we are faithless, Jesus is faithful. And you can read that in 2 Timothy 2.13. In fact, Jesus is so faithful. He is so full of faith, so perfect in his faith, in his obedience to God, that he perfects our faith. He is the perfecter of our faith, which is imperfect. Hebrews chapter 12, 1 through 2 tells us, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Did you catch that? Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. We are incapable of even having faith without Jesus. God doesn't ask us to have perfect faith. He knows that's an impossibility for humans. What he does ask is that we trust him to provide the faith that we need through his son, Jesus Christ. To trust with childlike faith, to trust with a childlike lack of doubt that it is God who even makes it possible for us to have faith in the first place. In Luke 18, verse 27, Jesus says, The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Do we believe this? Do we have childlike faith that God can make it possible? And brothers and sisters, childlike faith is not optional. If we don't have childlike faith, faith that God can do the impossible, that he can save us, that he is the author of saving faith, Jesus says we won't enter the kingdom. In Mark chapter 10, verses 14 through 15, Jesus says, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. We will not enter the kingdom of heaven unless we receive it as a little child. The question is, Have we received Jesus with childlike faith? Have we humbled ourselves, realizing we cannot pay for our own sins, our own beliefs, our own works, our own education, our own intellect, our own imaginings of what church should be like cannot get us to God. We are entirely dependent upon His grace. The question is, have we been childlike enough to cry out for mercy? Have we trusted in the means that God has provided for our forgiveness? Have we trusted in Jesus, his own son, the perfect lamb, that God himself sent down from heaven as the only acceptable payment for sins? And have we committed to walk with this childlike faith? If we aren't saved by our own efforts, if it's faith alone in Christ alone because of the grace of God that saves us, What makes us think that we are sanctified by any other means? 
the same childlike faith and humility of heart that causes us to cry out to God for mercy is the same childlike faith and humility of heart that we need to walk with the Lord. It is childlike. It is trusting. It is obedient. When Jesus says, follow me, will we leave everything behind and go? When Jesus says, who will come with me or who will go or who will proclaim my gospel? Who will be my hands and feet? Will we raise a hand and say, here I am, Lord. If Jesus calls us to lay down our lives as a pleasing sacrifice for the service of others, if he asks us to pay the ultimate sacrifice, to die as martyrs for the testimony of the gospel, as so many of our brothers and sisters before us have done, will we mimic his sacrifice, having walked with him, having watched him, having abided with him, having borne testimony of his sacrifice time and time again? Will we stretch out our arms as that young lady who gave up her life to save those two children did, as he stretched out his 2,000 years ago, as the Passover lamb who takes away the sin of the world and say, Here I come, Lord. I love you all so much.